Don't click off just yet. I'm not going to make us cry this week. I promise I will not make us cry this week. Everything bothers him. He's unbothered. He calls it unbothered, but that's what's cute because everything bothers him. He's bothered. I'm a botherina. What's up, everybody, and welcome to yet another episode of Unbothered by Ty Rivera. That's right, it's Unbothered by Ty Rivera. I'm your host, Ty Rivera, the absolute best LGBTQ comedian in the world. We're going to start this episode like we're going to start every episode from here on out, and that's by summoning the spirit of the one and only Snoopy Bijou. For anybody that wants a... Update on DJ Lindy. Wong, 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 wong. DJ Lindy is living in California. And he is really loving it over there. I'm sure at some point our paths will cross again. I do love that little boy. But at the same time, you have to accept what you are. And I am truly a girl dad. So I mesh better with female dogs bitches some would say but that's who I mesh with the most and so you know at some point I'll get another little girl and Lindy the door's open if he ever wants to come back but I gotta tell you guys Lindy is having such a good time living in California I know some of you weren't able to watch the episodes that were a lot more raw for me and especially the last episode I mean, it got decent views for my podcast, but I know that my podcast is always going to get more, excuse me, less views than my topical videos. I know this. That's just the way it works. And that's something I fully do accept. How much longer I'll continue to do my podcast on this channel, I'm not sure. I might move it to my secondary channel, which is technically called Unbothered by Ty Rivera, or I might just put it behind a paywall. I haven't exactly decided yet. I don't really know how much it messes with the algorithm. Everything seems to do all right. But if that changes, then I'll have to change with that. Because really, you know, the podcast, while I do like connecting with you guys, if I get so much fewer viewers and it turns out to not make the most sense monetarily, being that this is what this channel technically is about, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to continue it here, but I will continue it for as long as it makes sense. Which reminds me, if you get a chance, hit the super thanks. If you don't want to do a super thanks, maybe become a member. How about that? Maybe go down below and hit join. There's memberships for as low as $3. Maybe you don't like going through YouTube. Then hit my Patreon. Once I get to 1,000 Patreon members, I'm going to do a giveaway. I'm going to do a giveaway and I'm going to talk about that more as it develops, but I already know because I want a thousand Patreon subscribers and I also want a thousand paid members, a thousand paid Patreon subscribers and a thousand paid members on this channel. Those are my goals and I'm going to make them happen because the more I think about my life and the way that things have gone, which just to catch anybody up, and like I said, we won't do it in an emotional way. Everything's very matter of fact for me today because of the way that I've been processing and the amount that I've been meditating and really thinking on and reflecting on exactly the way the last month and a half has gone down. And my thing is, I really, even though there's... uh tendency to want to second guess yourself there is no way I would have given up on my girl if I didn't know that it was time and even now I don't fully give up on her because I know that we will be reunited I know that for a fact and I'm very secure in that so that's something that has made me feel better but I have found it very beneficial to talk about it because even though I kind of had second thoughts once I had posted the last Unbothered because I was like, this is me being really raw because it was recorded at 8 p.m. or around 8 p.m. If you watch the video, it'll tell you exactly what time because I say it at the beginning. And that had happened at between 10.30 and 10.40 a.m. So... You know, it was uh, 
I was really raw at the time. And so I second guessed that too, where I was like, maybe I shouldn't have put that out there. But I've kind of lived most of my adult life on social media, depending on the platform. And there have been many times that I thought exposing too much about my personal life was a mistake. And there are certain things that I completely won't talk about on social media and things that have been said on me on social media that I've never bothered to address. So it's not like I have no impulse control, but it's just I found that at times when I thought that maybe things weren't the smartest, they did turn out to be very healing for me in certain ways because I'm a person that really does go off intuition. And so when it came to that situation, immediately after, I did regret it. I was just like, yeah, that probably isn't going to stay up long because I don't like how raw I am on it. But you guys really did come through for me. And to the people that said that, you know, they just recently had a pet pass so they weren't able to watch it, but they were just leaving condolences. I 100% get you. And I would tell you to never for anybody put yourself in a position that you don't need to be to or excuse me, put yourself in a position or a space that you don't need to be in mentally or emotionally because you're trying to support another person. Come back and support me later. Come back to come back and support me on an episode like this where it's not going to hurt you, where it's not going to take anything away from you, because that's never my intention. My real intention with this podcast is to entertain. But when it came to Bijou, she was so much a part of everything that I did that there was no way that I could just let her pass and not acknowledge it to my fans. And also, or I should say her fans. You guys are my friends, but her fans. Because <laughs> people really did love that little dog. People love Lyndon too. And that's why I'll continue to give you guys updates. I don't plan to just be like, uh, that's not, you know, he'll always be connected to me. But I do honestly feel that sometimes you are, and I'm not trying to be too deep or too weird here, but sometimes you are just a vessel to take something from one place to the next. And he really is thriving with D. So I feel like it would be pretty unfair of me to uproot him right now and be like, hey, you come back with me because I need emotional support or whatever the case would be that, I would or whatever the reason would be that I would go get him right now and right now I've been doing so much around my place you know as far as straightening up like the way that I've dealt with things has been very healthy you know there has been a fair amount of me breaking down here and there because it's only been a week today's the one week anniversary I got Bijou's ashes today I was actually very happy about that though because I do feel like she's back with me and I felt I feel like she's been with me every day. So um, but as far as you guys go and what you guys have done for me, like all the stories did help me out. And when people have told me that the different way or about the different ways that they felt after they had to make that decision or what they went through. That was helpful too. Also, the inspirational people, when people told me that they thought that their dog was, you know, on death's door and then all of a sudden they were able to bring it back, that does make me happy. It's like there's so much good that has come from me talking about that and the amount of support. And there were times where I'd get a message that offered condolences. And it would not take me on a spiral, but it would just like make me feel emotions about it at a particular moment. But I felt like those emotions were important, too. And then when people told me about their pets passing, that was very helpful for me, too, because when you think about somebody else, you know, like you're grieving. Obviously, I was I am grieving. I was grieving. And then somebody sends you a message and they tell you about their situation, well, you have to take a break from your grieving 
to acknowledge what they're going through or what they've been through. Because some people hit me up and were like, I just had that happen two weeks ago. One person hit me up and said, their cat of 20 years, literally the day I posted that, they went through the same thing. So when you have to take a break from thinking about yourself, because even though some people would describe me as a sociopath or whatever these people say about me online that have no idea what it is I'm actually like, because... Different people have different opinions of me, but the people that actually know me would not describe me as the things as the the things that the people that hate me online say. And I don't think anybody that really watches me and doesn't just hate watch me with an opinion of me already thinks those things of me like yeah I may be insensitive in certain ways but the thing I'm most guilty of is being inconsiderate like there are just so many things that I don't consider and I talked about that on uh, an episode that I may or may not put out because I don't know if I want to take it to that space I may just put it behind the paywall and that's what I'll probably do in the next couple of days so anybody that pays for my stuff that is already a member or is already on my Patreon. The next video I put out, I'll definitely put a disclaimer in the title so that you'll know not to watch it. But it was from day one of Bijou and the way that, you know, day one of like after she died. And so um, I repeat certain things on there, but there's also plenty of stuff that wasn't you like you know it's not all it's like very little is repeated but the reason that i repeat certain stuff in there that you heard on the video if you saw the last one is because i originally had planned to make that one private the one i actually put out and then this one was going to be the one for public and then i decided to do it opposite um and really i was going to scrap the other one and then i just decided in the last day or two yeah i'll put that on the behind the paywall just so people can see more of like you know what my thinking was because i do think that that's important you know for people to see some of the guilt that i was going through and some of the thinking that i was having because like i said that's one of the things that helped me in the comments was when people were saying stuff like that i was like oh so this is natural that i feel this way because there's a part of you that afterwards feels like i'm a murderer I am a monster. I had to have my best friend killed. (laughs) Like, that's the way, you know, like, and you really at that, like, I'm laughing about it now because I can look at it like that funny way right now. But like when I felt that the most last week, it was agonizing. Like it really did take me to dark places and not like you have to check do a wellness check or anything like that i'm not playing that card but there was one day i thought that way and it was when i was back in phoenix and my parents have a garage and all i'll say is i i did honestly for a minute consider me and bijou just taking a nap together in the garage because i was just like yeah i don't want to live in the live in a world without this little dog but i got past that and obviously i didn't do it but now I'm not at all in that space, you know, and I know that I'll always feel that, you know, feel like that closeness with her or that missing her on a certain level because she just really was that much of a part of my life. But like what I was saying about the um, the people telling me their stories is like when you have to take a minute out of your grief to think about somebody else and what they're going through sometimes that's a very welcomed reprieve because you just get to a point where you're like okay i can only dwell on this for so long i can only continue to think about what i'm going through and about what you know i could have done differently and where i might have gone wrong and the guilt of it all and then somebody says their story and you're like yeah Let me concentrate on you a minute. Let me send out, because, you know, I look at a lot of us as like almost satellite dishes, you know? So where one person, or it was a lot of people, it was a lot of you on uh, on the community post as well as the different videos I did. Um, I have to say, so many of you 
sent me so much positive energy that I really did feel like I personally could kind of be like a mirror or almost, like I said, a satellite dish where something's beaming towards me because there was a lot of positivity beaming towards me. And so if I'm able to redirect and beam that out to somebody else that's going through a hard time, I am happy to do that because I had an overabundance of positive energy thrown at me. And so, you know, that to me was very comforting. So like I said, in the end, I felt like it all was very positive, even though there's always that tendency with me. I've talked about that when it comes to stage, you know, when me with me when I do stand up is there are times when I'm doing stand up where I'll say so many deeply personal things about myself in joke form, of course, but I will say so many deeply personal things about myself. And in my head, while I'm doing it, I'll be thinking, why are you saying this? Why are you saying this? to a room full of strangers right now. It's almost like if a sibling were to get a hold of your diary and just start reading it to a room full of strangers, except for it's not a sibling, it's you doing it and you're actually exposing yourself and sharing these things that really feel almost like they should be secrets or they should stay inside your head or in your heart. But anytime that I've done that, I've later on been able to think about it and be like, why did you say that? And why did you say it in that way? And some of my best jokes have actually come from that space, from that saying stuff that I shouldn't be saying and betraying myself in a sense. But it helps me grow as a person and it helps me grow as a comedian. And I know that a lot of you guys that pay attention to my social media, which if you can follow my other social medias, they're down in the description, you know, like my Instagram and my Twitter, my Facebook. But if you pay attention to me on any of the other social media platforms, you know that I am known for clapbacks. I am known for really being what they would call a savage online. And that has been my reputation. And that definitely is a part of what I am and what I do. And so I think it's also nice sometimes to open up and show you guys the more vulnerable side of myself and actually say at different points, right now I'm weak, you know, which I don't mean in this moment, but all those weeks that that was going on, I definitely was weak, especially towards the end. I was so run down because, you know, for a minute there, I was keeping up with Lindy and Bijou and trying to take care of Bijou. And I had Lindy running everywhere and he's a puppy. So he's going to be a puppy and he's going to do puppy things. And, you know, then I'm like making their food and I'm still going to the gym because I know that that's such a big part of my mental health. A lot of people think of the gym as like a place where you go to feed your vanity. And I won't lie, I do like when my body looks good. But what's more important to a person like me is actually the mental health benefits and the endorphins because I really do need those and especially during those times I really did need that release and just to get away and while I was gone I could leave Bijou alone and she would you know she'd be in her enclosure she'd be in her doggy playpen but I was able to just you know really uh like give her a break so that she could do what she had to do to heal and just sleep. And like, that's something I think about sometimes, like when I was gone, if Lindy was like maybe bugging her at the cage or whatever, and maybe I shouldn't have, you know, but hindsight is twenty twenty, And like, sometimes you think of things in a particular way and you just don't think about others. And I can't beat myself up for being a human being. And I can't beat myself up for not knowing everything. And I can't beat myself up for not being a vet. And I can't beat myself up for not knowing that there were certain questions that maybe I could have asked or certain things that maybe I should have noticed. And all that stuff, like I said, you can kick yourself about it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. And it, it's in the past. So are you going to live in the past? Because 
I mean, like, I know that, you know, there have been times in my life when I haven't been the most caring of the people around me or I haven't been the most checked in when it came to certain things. But I was so dialed in during those weeks and that's what eventually ended up exhausting me and what really ran me down and why the last week has been a lot of me catching up on eating and learning to sleep because you know i i really wasn't sleeping enough or i wasn't getting quality sleep i would sleep but i wasn't getting quality sleep because you know it, that part's hard when your best friend is going through something so difficult and there's nothing you can do and you can't even ask them on a regular basis how do you feel what are you going through right now because you know, you can see them just laying there and they look peaceful enough, but they're dogs. So you don't know if they're, they're going through agonizing pain right now and just have no way of verbally expressing that. So you can't do anything to help them if that is what they're going through. And so, you know, I really did like after that happened, I went to Golden Corral and I ate a couple of plates there. And then the next day I went to a buffet that was right next to the gym that I go to. And, you know, um, that was not only because I really did need to eat because I hadn't been eat and I would have this plan every day, you know, where I'd be like, I'm going to eat this tonight. And then I would just get busy with doing the stuff that I had to do between making videos, between editing, because, you know, I still was putting out enough stuff, not as much as I would like to or not as much as I will on regular times, but I was putting out enough stuff and like, you know, just I wasn't taking care of myself. And so I ate and then, uh, you know, I have talked to you guys about it before that I definitely do have problems with food. I'm a body dysmorphic, and so I don't always eat the way that I'm supposed to eat. And when you add the fact that you're usually on a somewhat bland or strict diet to the fact that you're going through what could be described as a depression or a low point for sure, um then you really don't want to eat because not only are you already not naturally inclined towards just wanting to eat, you're thinking about it on the level of what's healthy and what's good for me and what will, you know, keep my body looking a particular way. And just because that's the way you're wired after so many years of doing that, you know, because like me actively working out and watching what I eat, that's been for the past 12 or 13 years now that I have really and mind you, I always had body issues. I just in my younger years. There were points where I thought that there was nothing I could do about it. Like I hadn't figured out how to diet and how to eat to make yourself look good. Um, and, you know, I hadn't like, no, that's a lie. Uh, it was even longer than that because, yeah, for because I started doing Atkins. Atkins was my first serious foray into learning how to eat in a particular way so that your body would look the way you want it to. And I did a 10 day induction. And in that 10 day induction, I think I lost nine or 10 pounds. So something like that. And it was really good, you know, and I was working out at the same time. I also happened to be living in my truck at that time and I was doing low carb and so that meant I always had a cooler with ice and I would put, you know, my food that was Atkins approved. I was the weirdest, not unhoused person ever because my friends used to make fun of me and they were like, you're the only homeless person I know that's actually on Atkins. And that was when I first moved to L.A. So 
that was 21 years ago, something like that. Yeah, and then there was a point where I was doing so much stand-up that I had no choice but to just, you know, like, because I ended up living in a place and uh, I found, uh, you know, a room that I could rent. It was with some other comedians. It was stressful, but whatever. Um, but, yeah, then I had this moment where I was so busy doing stand-up and working on stand-up stuff. And then at that time, I had two jobs at one point, like two regular jobs, then stand-up. Then I was also dating a guy at one point. And that was such a busy life that during that time, there was a lot of fast food. And then one of the guys that I was dating for quite a, you know, like a good four or six months, something like that. Um, he worked for Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles. And with the location he was at and his sister being the manager, he would get sent home with food every night. Really at Roscoe's, I don't know if that's the way it is now, but at that particular Roscoe's, they would send the employees home with the extra food at the end of the night. And so he would bring home, you know, red beans and rice, fried chicken, um, greens. He would bring home the uh, potato, smothered potatoes. He would bring all sorts of stuff home, and it was so good. And I have always loved fried chicken. That's one of the foods that I really do pretty much always love. I've learned to say no to it at different points now. But, you know, at that time, especially Roscoe's, it was so good. He was at the Long Beach location, and he would bring home food every single night, and I'd just be eating fried chicken. And uh, there was a point where I gained so much weight that I really was unhappy, but I didn't know how to stop it because I didn't want to tell him no to the food. And I also was so busy, like I said, and... Um, then I learned, uh, master cleanse, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with master cleanse, but that's the cayenne pepper, maple syrup, uh, grade it's grade B maple syrup. Now I think they let you use grade A, but at the time they used to insist on grade B. And so you had to order it from Canada and, you know, uh, yeah, it would come in this big jug. And uh, I think I would buy two of them because it came like in a you could buy this master cleanse packet uh, or package. And so what it was, though, was grade B maple syrup, lemon juice, uh, water and cayenne pepper. And that was your food for an entire 10 to 14 days, depending on how long you decided to do it. The first time I ever did it, I did it for 10 days. I would do full workouts. Um, I was nuts at that time. That was after me and my ex had broken up, you know, the, the Roscoe's guy. Um, we had broken up. And I decided to try Master Cleanse. And surprisingly, you do feel satiated after day three. They say that the third day is the hardest to get through, and I really have found that to be the experience. Like day one, you feel fine. It doesn't really hit you that you're not eating. You do a salt water flush starting on day two or day three. I can't remember. Every morning you drink a big 32 ounces of warm water and sea salt, and that is so hard to get down. On some days you just literally spit it out or it comes out through your nose it's all kind of a punishment but and if you do it just for weight loss reasons i found that that's not the most effective because you usually will fall off because your entire intention is superficial but if you're really trying to use it as a way to elevate yourself mentally and take advantages of or take advantage of the um benefits of not having solid food in your system, it really can be very beneficial. So the first time I ever did that, I did it for 10 days. I was doing full workouts and I was also taking Bikram's yoga, which is now turned into hot yoga because Bikram turned out to be more than a little bit of a creep, which if you guys want to find out the story about that, there's actually a movie on Netflix, a documentary on Netflix about it. Bikram apparently he was doing all sorts of shady stuff but he had several gyms in LA you know or yoga studios in LA 
And so I would do Bikrams, which is a 90 minute class. So on top of like two, two and a half hour regular workouts, and they were right next door to each other, the Bally's and the Bikram studio. If you guys are familiar with LA, it was the LA F fitness that was right on Ventura and uh there was a ross in between and then you know between the la fitness and the yoga studio and so i'd go to the gym i would do my full workout excuse me my full workout with cardio and uh then i would and i was only having that concoction of gravy bean, maple syrup cayenne pepper lemon juice and water and I'd have three of them a day, three 32 ounces, and you just sip them every time you get hungry. You sip one every time you get hungry. And so I'd go straight from there to the yoga studio and do 90 minutes of yoga. And I ended up losing 18 pounds in 10 days. And that was such a great start to where I actually wanted to be. And I really was ripped even after just that. Well. Really, after day four, I was ridiculously ripped. It was, it was sexy. It was nice. It really was, you know. Um, but then you finish the 10 days, and they say that you're supposed to, like, slowly get yourself back onto food. You start off with, like, vegetable broth is what they recommend, and then, you know, you work your way up to a salad. I never... <laughs> I never broke that in any kind of healthy way. I always would end up eating something like Oreos or, you know, <laughs> it was so bad. Like, I mean, like you're starving your body. Um, but I credit the master cleanse with the first time I got on Comedy Central. Uh, and I'll tell you guys that story in just a second. But um, yeah, so I lost 18 pounds. And when you lose that kind of weight, in 10 days, it inspires you to do even more and to be even more proactive in what it is you're doing. But first, you have those couple of days where you're just eating everything that you can eat. And I literally was eating everything I could possibly eat, you know? And I ended up gaining eight pounds back. But I was like, you know, I'm still 10 pounds down even with this eight pounds. And so after I got my metabolism or my eating back in check where I was able to actually slow down on wanting to do wanting to eat everything. Sorry if I'm making you a yawn right now. Um, after I got myself to slow down on wanting to eat, eat everything, then I got my diet back in check and I started doing like South Beach, I think was the next thing I did. And I was going by the principles of South Beach, but not actually doing the diet by the book in the way that, you know, using the recipes and stuff like that. I was just going by the principles. So I did that and I was working out because I stopped going to the yoga studio because the yoga studio, the the reason that I would do it, I couldn't afford it regular, but they used to have this deal where it was like $30 for 30 days if you were like a new member or something like that. And so I had done $30 for 30 days. And so, you know, that was covered like the 10 days or whatever. And, uh, Outside of that, it was expensive. Yoga is still expensive, if you ask me. It's like over $100 always if you're going to do an unlimited package of yoga. But anyway, um, so yeah. So then I started doing these ridiculous workouts where I do two hours of cardio. I ended up messing up my knee at a point from doing all that cardio because I was doing two hours of cardio and then I do weights. And I was not in a healthy place as far as the way that I was treating my body, even though my body looked really good at that time. And so um, I started doing master cleanse every six months. That was the way that I would do it to clear out my system. 
and I um, got myself to like a low body fat, a really like really maintaining uh, where I was doing well. But then there was just a point where I hit next level. And that was, like I said, like 14 years ago, I want to say is what it was. And, um, you know, uh, I, I just have trained myself so much to like not eat white bread. Like if I'm at my parents' house, that's where I'll splurge and stuff like that. And there are times I'm not as strict about it as I was at a point. Like if you check out my story, sometimes I'm eating more fast food than I should. But a lot of times that's because if you're working really hard and you're working out as well, you will find that at the end of it all, you are so depleted and the stuff that you would usually eat isn't sounding good at that moment. So you're like, okay, let me just get something that I will actually eat because I know that the animalistic part of me or the junk food fat kid inside of me will be drawn to it and actually eat it. So, you know, that's that's what I would do. And so the way that Master Cleanse helped me get on Comedy Central was there was a point where I would do 14 days of no food. I just master cleanse it for 14 days and I realized that on day 13 there is just this clarity that comes to me especially when it comes to comedy now mind you your body is starved so when you hear a noise it really is the instinct kicking in where you're brain is searching for food and something rustling could be something you could eat literally that's what it is and so you have a little bit of that where you know like if there's a noise you're gonna you're gonna notice real quick you know but um i notice that my thinking is so clear on that 13th day and i can like think of like my jokes or a set or it's just very easy for me to do comedy during those times. Um, and so I got a call from a guy named Eric Abrams is his name. And I know Eric is still in the business as far as comedy goes, but I'm not sure who he works for or where he works. I heard he's something big now, but, you know, he was doing well then too. And so he was handling the bookings for uh, Comedy Central Live at Gotham, the showcase. And I had turned in a video for that. You know, I had sent in a DVD literally to Comedy Central Studios. Anne was her name. I can't remember Anne's last name. She probably wouldn't want her last name on here anyway, but she used to be char in charge of that stuff. And so I had heard about her and I sent her a message on social media. I can't remember if it was Facebook, MySpace. I don't, I think it was Facebook. And I sent her a message saying that I would like to do, you know, like to send in a submission for Live at Gotham. And surprisingly enough, she responded to me and she sent me a message with the address. She said, send a message to this address. It's Comedy Central, care of, you know, her. And so I ran down and did that. You know, I was in a hurry. I was so excited that she even responded to me. And then that's when I was first starting to do the road where I was headlining. And so I started headlining in South Texas. You know, I was living in California, but I would get booked in South Texas. And so I got booked to headline. And I was driving back from Texas with my best friend. I had taken him. He's a comedian as well. Um, my best friend at the time. And I had taken him with me, which we'll talk about the at the time in a minute, because so many people attribute so much to the fact that, you know, friends come and go in my life sometimes. But it is what it is. Um, and so we were driving back together and Eric Abrams called me and he said, hey, uh, you know, I just wanted to let you know that 
we saw your submission and we wanted to see if you wanted to showcase for live at Gotham. And I was like, yeah, of course I want to showcase for live at Gotham. And he said, okay, well, your showcase will be on this particular date and it will be at the Irvine Improv. And so I was like, okay. And I counted off 13 days from that date. And I made a plan in my head that 13 days before that date, I was going to start Master Cleanse. And so I ordered all my stuff. You know, it was like a couple months out that it was supposed to be. So I had some time to prep for it and everything like that and mentally prepare and that kind of stuff and have it be between, you know, like a fair amount of time between those things. I don't do Master Cleanse anymore. I haven't done it in years, honestly. I, I realized that it probably isn't the best for your body even if mentally it does some things i'm not saying i would never do it again but i don't have an interest right now i can tell you that but um so yeah so i planned it for 13 days and according to plan because you know i can be very good with self-discipline right according to plan i started 13 days ahead of time and then on day 13, I remember I was panicking, you know, because it was it was time for me to do my showcase. And I remember thinking this is not going to go well. I don't even know what I want to do. So many things were flooding to me and nothing sounded like, you know, the best way to go at it. And I couldn't come up with a set list. And so it was like 10 minutes before I was supposed to go on. And I think we were doing three minute showcases what w was what we were doing. And we're at the Irvine Improv and I had to run to the bathroom real quick. And I remember going to that bathroom. And I remember when I walked into the bathroom, the bathroom itself at the Irvine Improv, all of a sudden my set list just came flowing into my head. And so I had like my, cause I always used to have a pad of paper on me, you know, or a tablet on me. And so I just took out my tablet and I started writing the bullet point, the keyword for every one of the jokes that I wanted to do. I was like, I'm going to do this one. I'm going to do this one. I'm going to go into this one. I'm going to close on this one. And, you know, and my jokes, a lot of them, I do know what the time on them is. Like people will ask me all the time, even to this day, they'll be like, how much time do you need um, for a, when should we give you the light? And I'll tell them, you know, um, an amount of time to give me the light in. That's because I know how long my closing joke will be. And sorry, I'm yawning. I have been working tonight. You know, like I recorded a video and I'm going to edit it. And, you know, I really have cleaned my apartment the last couple of days. I'm proud of the way that I'm living. But that's part of the Bijou situation. Like, because that's part of how I feel better about everything as I, you know, promised Bijou in the last couple of days, you know, where I was like, you know what, Bijou? I'm going to be the best daddy I can possibly be, even though you're not here because I know you're watching me. I'm going to make you proud. I'm going to clean up this apartment like it's never been cleaned before. And I have delivered on that. And I was like, and I'm going to put out content like I'm supposed to. And I know that you moved on so that I could focus on the stuff that I focused on little selfless dog which I really wish she had been selfish and chosen to stay with me because I know that's what she wanted but it is what it is uh that's and I'm not getting emotional right now I just really am appreciative to her for what she did even though I wish she hadn't done it um but I have gotten my stuff in check here. And so uh, wherever I was going with that, when it comes to the Comedy Central thing, I went on stage and I executed exactly the way that I was supposed to execute. I did it exactly the way that I had planned it in that bathroom right before I went on. And like I said, I went in the bathroom less than 10 minutes or 10 minutes before I was supposed to go on stage. 
And so I came up with the jokes that I wanted to do. I executed them perfectly. The audience went absolutely nuts. And anybody that was there will tell you that. Uh, Siddiqui Fuller was there, which uh, Siddiqui passed maybe five years ago or something like that. One of the worst things ever, Siddiqui passing. And it wasn't like, you know, he self-deleted or anything. It was something that took him out. I can't remember exactly what it was, but Siddiqui has passed. And he was there. Kyle Irby, I believe, was there. I can't even remember all the other comics, but there were a fair amount of comics that I really liked and respected and had been coming up with, you know, because that was me only being like four years into comedy, I think it was, or five years into comedy. Maybe it was six, 2007? Was it 2007 I was in? I, I think it was 2007 that I was on Comedy Central the first time. And that was, uh, I had started in 2003, so four years. And so, um, you know, I really did nail it. And I do attribute that to doing the master cleanse. And so maybe I'll do the master cleanse if I decide to record a special. People have been telling me that I should record a special, and maybe I will. You know, I'm going to come out of retirement. That's going to happen. But I just haven't decided how, and I haven't decided when, and I don't really care how, and I don't really care when. Everything in my life, especially lately, has been very organic and that's the way that I want it to be like there are times that like I said I have manifested things so I knew that I wanted them but sometimes even when I was saying them I didn't realize that I was being serious and that the universe was taking my words and making them happen and you know I guess maybe I need to start purposely or purposefully manifesting more things. Maybe I need to start really thinking about because I just, you know, I kind of let things happen in a lot of cases. Like people have asked me if I'm going to stay in Austin and I don't know if I'm going to stay in Austin. I haven't put any actual plan into place of not being in Austin but I also don't know how connected I feel to this city at this point and I also don't know how much I'm going to hold the death of Bijou against Austin you know I don't know how much I'm actually going to resent this city and I don't know how much it's going to play on me that you know the place I took Bijou to have her final moments was actually some like it's on my way a lot of places like there are a lot of opportunities for me to just look over and be like oh that's That's the doctor's office right there, you know, like last night I went to Walmart and on my way back, you know, I have to circle that freeway and then I drive right past the doctor's office where it happened. But, you know, who knows how I'll feel about any of that in a couple of days or in a couple of weeks, because I already feel very at peace. I picked up her ashes today and I'm glad that she's you know, in her physical form, even though it's Ash, back with me. And I set up her bed in a way, which I had already done in my cleaning process, because like I said, I I said that I was going to do that stuff. I promised Bijou that I was going to do that. And I promised her that I was going to stop procrastinating so much. And I've even made her small promises. Like a lot of times, right before I go into the gym, I know this is counterproductive, but right before I go into the gym, I'll smoke two cigarettes. And um, I started off small with that one. And I was like, okay, you can only have one cigarette before you go into the gym. And so I've really kept myself to that. And there have been moments where I'm like, 
you know what? I want another cigarette before I go into the gym. I usually have two, and I'm like, you said, and that's a slippery slope. Once you start going back on your word, suddenly you don't have a word anymore. And so I've really been forcing myself to just have the one cigarette. But, you know, procrastination, that's something. I promised Bijou last night. This one I was bad about today, though, because I promised her that I would stop thinking about the days leading up and the things that I could do differently because whether or not I I like the way everything went or whether or not I have regrets about not like I said not noticing certain things or not picking up on every cue that maybe I should have the fact is we are where we are and the way that it went down is the way that it went down and so it does me no good to sit and think about it it's a waste of time and it's not at all honoring her because she's gone you know so to once in a while remember our best times which i can't help but do anyway because my phone always shows them to me i have so many pictures of bijou on my phone that dog was so loved uh and so i have so many pictures of her in my phone that it really is like impossible i can't fall apart every time it happens because it just would be happening all the time because every time i you know how you have iphone and if you scroll back or you know like you uh go past that first screen it just automatically shows you a memory and bijou is always on there and it makes me happy it makes me happy to see her i'm glad i don't want to get rid of the pictures that i have of her on my phone because i do like once in a while a quick injection of like, ah, my beach. <laughs> There's just a quick moment where I'm always like, oh, my baby. I get to see her real quick, you know. Um, but then the other day, I this is one that felt very cosmic to me or the universe telling me that I had done things the right way is because I was giving myself a hard time, you know, where I was like, she was maybe not as tired as I thought she was. Maybe I jumped a gun. Maybe she wasn't as, because it wasn't about tired, you know, it was about exhausted. It was about her little body just, I didn't feel like it could take anymore. And I had, I but my brain was playing this evil trick on me, uh, which if anybody else's brain is doing this, figure out how you're going to stop it or find a way to stop it. And I'm going to tell you what was very beneficial to me. But, um, I was really having that struggle where my brain was playing tricks on me and it was telling me that, you know, I had done the wrong thing and that I had jumped the gun and I had done it too soon and it was me being selfish and I had just given up on her. And literally, this is the way my brain was talking to me. And usually it takes a while for things to show up as memories because they're not memories yet. They're current pictures, you know. And I accidentally did the scroll thing, not scrolling in my pictures. Like I said, that scroll past the first screen. And for some reason, the memory from like two days before, the memories were of that day, the day that I had to put her down. And the picture that it showed me was one that will probably stay private forever, just my own, you know. But it really was her in bad shape, just done, just exhausted and done. And that told me, yeah, you did it the right way. And then I looked through some other pictures just because I felt inspired to at that moment, just to see if my brain was playing tricks on me. And I look at it and I'm like, yeah, technically she looked done three weeks ago. It was just, you know, when you love something so much, you refuse to see it. So like that's what I was dealing with was during those moments, I just had so much hope and I had so much faith and I'm thankful for both of those things because I really felt that we needed all of that time together. I feel like we needed every moment we had. If you ask me, we needed more, but every moment that we actually had, we definitely did need for our process or maybe for my process, but we needed that time. And so I'm glad I didn't see it. But at the same time, I felt a little bad for not seeing it, for just being so full of hope that I was like refusing to see it. And also just, you know, like I said, when you love something that much, you don't want to see it as deteriorating or almost done or whatever. You're just like, no, we can fix this. We can make this 
still work, you know? And uh, so what I would recommend to people is because, you know, me and Bijou lived such a public life, and I loved having her on my social media. And I had the hope that it was all going to turn around. I took so many pictures and videos of the process. And then even when it was leading up to the last day, uh, or when it was the last day and leading up to the final moments, I still was taking pictures and videos. Um, but at that point, I almost felt bad about it, you know, where I felt like, Maybe this is wrong of me to be doing this. Maybe I'm exploiting the death of my dog right now, you know? Um, but I still did it anyway, you know? And I didn't post it anywhere. None of the stuff that I feel is really private did I post anywhere. Um, and so it was, but I'm very thankful that I did it because I realized that even if I didn't know it consciously, that it was going to help me a lot because it let me know that even if my mind plays tricks on me, I can look at those pictures and those videos and I can know that it really was time. And it's only because you want to still have that hope and you want to think that things were better than they were at the end rather than accepting what they actually were uh that, that you would remember them any other way and so i am glad that i have those pictures and videos and they're gonna end up one day being some of my not favorites i would say but most prized um as far as bijou goes because you know, I really did. I really did see her to the end. And, uh, you know, when I did what I did uh, or the vet did what he did, I stayed with her. And it was just a formality at that point. It really was like this little girl has suffered enough and she's done it all for me. And now the least I can do for her is go ahead and let her not have to deal with this pain anymore. And the video reminds me that that was the right decision. I'm so thankful for that because otherwise I would really be in a much worse place. I'd feel a lot more guilty than, you know, anything I'm having to deal with now. Like I said, there's still some and my mind will still lie to me every once in a while. So that's what I would tell other people that are maybe, you know, uh, which God forbid, I hope that nobody goes through this, you know, I, and I really do mean that even people I don't like, I wouldn't wish that on them because it's such a terrible feeling, you know, but if anybody is going through that or finds themselves in that predicament, take as many pictures as possible. That's your best friend that is in all likelihood the last time you're going to see them or it's the last time you're going to see them in that form in this world. So there's that reason. But then there's also so that you will not be in danger of your mind tricking you into believing that there was more hope there at the end than there actually was. Because that's like the biggest thing with me and Bijou was, you know, when the... because really her doctor the vet had said like two weeks before that he thought i should do it and i was like no nah, just give her a kennel log shot and we're gonna work through it and the kennel log shot did help you know and that's one thing you'll read about and see if you're ever going through this is that sometimes the steroids really will help them out and they will have that last hurrah sometimes you know and there was a little bit of a last hurrah it wasn't a big one but there was a little bit of a last hurrah that gave me some false hope and so um you know but i knew it wasn't time i knew it wasn't time but then on the day that it was it really was and i had to just make myself do it in a borderline emotionless way because if I allowed my emotions to really get into it I would once again try to force myself to find hope and I would at that point extend out something that she didn't need to go through and so 
in future episodes, this probably won't be something that we talk about, but this felt important to mention in this episode because, you know, if somebody else, like I said, finds themselves in that same situation, that's the best advice I could give you. So I hope you guys forgive me for talking about it towards the end, but at least I didn't start crying. Stay unbothered.